Domenico del Ghirlandaio was a Florentine painter from the second half of the 15th century. As you can see, his dates are 1449 to 1494. And he's primarily active in the last uh, two decades of the century, the 1480s and of course the early 1490s. So if you're looking for just a general date to use from Ghirlandaio, around 1485. Uh, comes fairly close to the date of most of the works of art that we will be looking at in the class. Um, we generally refer to him as Ghirlandaio, so that's all you have to give me for an identification. Uh, I will assume that you're talking about Domenico. He was an extremely successful painter uh, in Florence. Uh, he was very popular with uh, the wealthy uh, merchant class, uh, the people who had enough money to uh, uh, purchase works of art, uh, but maybe they weren't into some of the esoteric things like Neoplatonism, like the uh, Medici were. Hart, when he wrote his book on Italian Renaissance art, called Ghirlandaio prose. In uh, when Hart wrote his book on Italian Renaissance art, he called Ghirlandaio prose. In contrast to Botticelli, whom he called poetry. And that's not really a bad definition. Um, Ghirlandaio is famous for these calm, solid figures. Uh, his compositions usually have many, many figures, and uh, sometimes, I don't know how many you're going to be seeing today, but uh, sometimes you will have figures where you have all of these portraits of the people, uh, the patrons and the, their associates and famous people in Florence uh, standing around next to the sacred scene, uh, sort of like uh, extras in a movie. Uh, he's been called calm and sensible, sort of a, a very rational space. Um, and figures that are very much uh, physically present in the world that is created in the illusion uh, of the paintings of Ghirlandaio. So let's look at some of them. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is a Last Supper. It dates from about 1480, and it was painted for the refractory in the monastery of, uh, that's attached to the church of the Ognissante. Uh, all saints, or each saint is what Ognisante means. So um, there is a monastery attached to it, and the refectory is the dining hall. And we've already heard that with Castaño, that it became a tradition in Tuscan art to have the Last Supper painted on the end wall of a refectory of a monastery or a nunnery, um, because then you had the illusion that you were having dinner with Christ, that you were participating in the Last Supper, and it's sort of like Christ is at the head table. Now, we think that the composition of this may have been based on a castaño, uh, probably not the one that you have already seen, the one in Santa Apollonia but one that is lost, that no longer exists, that used to be in uh, the church of Santa, the one that used to be in Santa Maria Nuovo. But you can see things that are, um, you have in common with the Castaño that you have seen, uh, an architectural structure. Here it's very different. You have these uh, large groined arches. And then you have, uh, in this case, also something very different than what we've seen with Castaño, this view uh, outside, looking through these uh, great arches, and we see uh, the tops of trees, as though there's an orchard or a garden outside, and uh, uh, birds of prey uh, uh, attacking smaller birds, actually, is, is uh, what's going on. Uh, and then, uh, in the room of the Last Supper, the uh, upper room, we have the long table uh, that uh, here uh, bends and comes toward the viewer on each end. And the traditional arrangement of Judas, uh, the, uh, the betrayer, who is placed on the opposite side of the table. Uh, he's, of course, looking at Christ. Uh, but he has no halo. He's separated from the virtuous apostles. 
And uh, here we see John, of course, uh, sort of reclining on his master's breast, as the uh, gospel has it. So uh, you have this uh, visual interaction between uh, Judas, the betrayer, who is shown here in profile. That's also very traditional. You don't want to look into the eyes of uh, this very evil man. You don't want to get the evil eye. Uh, you'll notice here that uh, Ghirlandaio has also has uh, some interaction with St. Peter. And St. Peter has picked up a knife, uh, and he's glowering at uh, and he's glowering at Judas. Uh, looks like, you know, I'm going to take care of you. And you may remember that Peter, uh, during the arrest of Christ, Peter actually fought back. He took a, uh, a knife or a sword, and he, he took a knife, and he cut off the ear of one of the soldiers or the soldier's servant, and Christ had to heal the man. Um, you do have all sorts of different facial expressions and gestures. Some people don't seem to notice what's going on. Other people are aware of it. Here's one person that looks like he's kind of bored with the whole thing. Uh, so, uh, so what do I want to say? One person kind of looks like he's bored with the whole thing. He's resting his head on his hand. But uh, a variety of poses. I'm going to show you something else. It's a Last Supper by Ghirlandaio, and uh, when you're saying, oh, that's the same one I just saw, take another look. There are some very strong similarities, but a few differences. And about the same time, he painted another Last Supper, this one in the refectory of San Marco in Florence. Now, you might say, well, how can he go get away with painting two things that are so similar? Well, they're in monasteries. Presumably, the cloistered monks uh, from uh, the Dominican monastery of San Marco aren't going to be wandering over to the Ognisanti and checking out the painting on their wall. Uh, they're, they're both very satisfactory paintings. Uh, let me point out just a few of the differences here, well, a few of the, some of the similarities and the differences. Uh, the room is arranged in a very similar fashion with these large uh, vaulted ceilings with the groin vaults. And then, of course, we have the arches where we see the view of the uh, birds and the um, tops of the trees outside. Uh, the room is arranged very similarly. He's probably used the same cartoon for many of the parts. Um, the colors are a little different. Judas is wearing, for example, a different color. And... Um, Peter, although he has the knife in hand and is glowering at uh, Judas, uh, not quite as vehemently, perhaps. Uh, John actually looks like he's snoozing on his master's breast, uh, you know, or sleeping on the table, perhaps. Uh, and uh, what Judas is doing is uh, getting the sop. So what we're seeing here is the moment when Judas is identified. Uh, Christ says, one of you Christ says, one of you will betray me. And the apostles say, who, who is it? And, it's, and Christ replies, it is he to whom I give the sop, uh, the bread dipped in the wine. And so here we have Judas receiving that. You might notice that there's a little kitty cat next to Judas. And um, you know, there have been different discussions about what that cat might mean. Uh, in many cases, people believe the cats were what uh, familiars of witches and that they were uh, being nocturnal creatures, uh, that they were uh, perhaps a symbol of the devil. On the other hand, cats caught mice, and mice you know, uh, were often seen as symbols of the devil too. Uh, so it's not quite clear, uh, at least to us modern people who like cats, uh, exactly what the cat is doing there. Uh, but we do find many Last Suppers where you have a cat and often a dog as well. And sometimes there's an antagonism between them. And people suggest that that's like the antagonism, in a sense, between uh, Christ and Judas. But here it's, it's just the cat sitting there looking out at us. Uh, you know, is it a virtuous or a demonic symbol or simply they put a cat in the picture? But that's the way you tell the San Marco refractory uh, fresco from the one at the Ognisante, is the presence of the kitty cat. And here you here are some of the details. Uh, we, when we're talking about that, you can see the change in the pose of St. Uh, John.
Ghirlandaio was commissioned uh, to paint uh, an altarpiece and frescoes on the wall of the uh, uh, Sassetti Chapel. It's the name of the family. It's their family chapel in the Church of the Holy Trinity, Santa Trinita in Florence. And so here you see uh, the whole arrangement with the uh, tiers of scenes going up the wall. Uh, but what we're going to look at uh, is the altarpiece itself. And here you can see it's an adoration of the shepherds. The shepherds are uh, in the uh, right side of the picture, uh, pointing to the Christ child. The Christ child, as in St. Bridget's vision of the nativity, is lying on the ground. Uh, here, he's lying on the uh, on the garment of the Virgin Mary. Now that's a motif that was introduced into art by Roger van der Weyden, and I think I mentioned that before when we talked about um, Piero della Francesca. Uh, by this time, you know, I don't know that Ghirlandaio ever knew, uh, you know, where it came from because it has become a, uh, a motif that is used by a number of artists. So Mary is adoring the Christ child and the ox and the ass are looking on. Uh, Joseph is looking off into the distance. He's shading his eyes. And what he's seeing uh, approaching is the retinue of the Magi. Uh, so the, uh, the three Magi or the three kings are on their way and they have not yet arrived at the stable, but they're, they're coming. And then, of course, you have this amazing landscape that just goes on with these uh, little rounded hills going far back into the distance. Well, there's two major things that I want to point out about this. One is the use of classical motifs, and the other is the influence of Netherlandish art, very specifically uh, a particular picture in Netherlandish art. The Netherlandish influence is very specifically from the Portinari altarpiece, which is a very large triptych that is now in the Uffizi, but was painted for the hospital of Santa Maria Nuovo in Florence. Uh, the patronage is from Tommaso Portinari, hence it's called the uh, Portinari altarpiece. And Tommaso Portinari was the Medici representative in Bruges and London. And he ordered a, a number of pictures from Netherlandish masters. This one from Hugo van der Hoes and uh, several from Hans Memlink. By 1483, this was in Florence and it was in a public place. It was somewhere uh, that Ghirlandaio uh, obviously uh, had gone and looked at it. There are a number of details uh, that, uh, that seem to be similar. Uh, some of them could have come from anywhere. You know, you could have the Christ child lying on the ground. That's from St. Bridget's vision. It doesn't have to come from Hugo van der Hoos. Now, there is that interest in the figures of the ox and the ass, which we often see in Netherlandish art, and here we see in Ghirlandaio. But the detail that tells us that he really was looking at the Portinari altarpiece uh, is the detail of the shepherds. Uh, they are a perhaps more simplified version of the uh, very naturalistic, rustic shepherds of uh, Hugo van der Hoes. And as you can see, he's showing the shepherds in three different ages with sort of three different degrees of comprehension about what is going on. Uh, the shepherds from Hugo van der Hoes are more detailed. Uh, they are uh, more active. But certainly these are almost quotations, a, a variant quotation of the Hugo van der Hoos shepherds. The other point I wanted to make about this picture is that Ghirlandaio has used classical architectural elements uh, and sculptural elements, as we can see. Uh, here we have the classical piers, uh, which are holding up the rustic roof of the stable. And we have a triumphal arch with an inscription referring to Pompeii, uh, through which the three kings are passing. So this certainly illustrates the Renaissance interest in classical antiquity. And then the manger itself is 
a classical sarcophagus. Uh, and, you know, as we know from the Bible, the Christ child is placed in the manger. Uh, but here it is a sarcophagus. So certainly this is a reference to the death of Christ. But uh, we know that from that sarcophagus, uh, Christ uh, returned to life. So in a sense, it can also remind us of the resurrection. But here, as Christ is first manifest in the flesh, uh, as he is born in human form, uh, there is a reference to his uh, sacrificial death. Ghirlandaio also had the commission to paint uh, a whole series of paintings for the church of Santa Maria Novella. Uh, the patron was Giovanni uh, Toraboni, and you have on one side the life of Mary, and on the other side uh, the story or the life of St. John the Baptist. We're going to look at just one of these pictures. Uh, this is the birth of the Virgin. It's a fresco. Uh, on the wall of Santa Maria Novella. And once again, you see that uh, interest in classical antiquity uh, simply in the architecture and uh, this painted uh, frieze of putti, all these little uh, classical loves as they are, uh, going around the upper part of the uh, room in which uh, Mary is being born. Uh, this is actually in the place that we call spalliere, uh, or spalliere paintings. Uh, the word just means shoulder, but sort of high on the wall uh, above a wainscoting. Uh, and certainly it's a very elaborate room. Uh, uh, St. Anne seems to be quite elevated in her, her status. Uh, the motifs that are on the piers uh, are classical motifs. And uh, he may have seen some of those when he was down in Rome. Um, and uh, they were excavating the uh, golden uh, palace, uh, the golden dome of Nero. And uh, they found some decorative uh, designs. So some of these start popping up in uh, uh, Florentine, uh, or start popping up in Italian art. Up in the upper uh, left, up the stairs, uh, we see a second scene, which presumably would be uh, at, uh, some other time and place uh, where Anne uh, and Joaquin are meeting, are embracing. Uh, you'll remember that uh, uh, Filippo Lippi did the same thing. He incorporated two scenes with, uh, in one uh, space and uh, had that little scene of the meeting of Joaquin and Anna, uh, where Joaquin and Anna meet uh, in a corner of the room where the birth of the Virgin is taking place. So St. Anne has already given birth to Mary. Uh, the uh, midwives or the helpers uh, are here holding the baby, getting ready to give her her first bath. And I want to point out some of the figures. We're going to look at a detail of the woman pouring water. But also notice the figure that's pretty much right in the center foreground, standing there in beautiful clothing uh, with her hands uh, clasped very modestly in front of her. And, serene, and she has um, all of these uh, women with her, these attendants. Uh, that is the daughter of the patron. This is Ludovica uh, Toraboni. In pictures of the birth of the Virgin, you often do have uh, friends of the mother coming to visit. Uh, and because this was evidently the this was evidently the custom of the time. Uh, you would, of course, have servants, but you also would have your friends come uh, to congratulate you on the, uh, the, the birth of the new child. So instead of just sort of, uh, you know, nobody, just uh, instead of just uh, anonymous figures uh, coming to uh, congratulate, uh, uh, so instead of just anonymous figures coming to congratulate St. Anne, we have an uh, actual Florentine woman, and it's, it's possible that the, the, uh, the women who are accompanying her could uh, actually be uh, other people as well. Uh, but certainly we know that this one figure is a portrait. I also wanted to point out this lively little figure of the woman pouring water, and we have the drawing for it, and you can see the fluttering draperies. Usually, Kirlin Dio's compositions and figures are you know, very, very calm, uh, 
but every once in a while, there's this one little lively figure in the uh, birth of the Baptist. There's another one who is uh, one of those figures with the, the fluttery drapery carrying something on her head that we've talked about before. Uh, so here we have this one uh, active, uh, graceful uh, figure that uh, just uh, but gives a little... Uh, this just gives a little moment of activity, a kind of lyric grace uh, to the picture. We know that Ghirlandaio was very good at painting portraits. Uh, he has so many portraits within the context of these religious scenes and the figures standing around. Uh, but he also painted this painting, which we call either an old man with a boy or an old man with his grandson. Uh, we haven't identified the actual person, but a grandson certainly a good uh, uh, assumption. Now, this painting incorporates a great deal of detail and uh, tiny little brush strokes and things that might not be seen as particularly beautiful. Uh, he does not idealize away. And I'm specifically talking about those bumps on the nose of the man. Uh, this has been identified as a specific disease of the nose, rhinophyma, and it indicates that Ghirlandaio was very interested in getting an extremely accurate portraiture. And we believe that this was probably uh, the influence of the Netherlands, where uh, they didn't always idealize the figures. Uh, they often showed, uh, what can we say, uh, specific details that were not always um, the most beautiful ones uh, in uh, a Netherlandish painting. Also, it's been suggested that the view out of the window is another reference to Netherlandish influence. Now, do we know who painted the first uh, landscape in the background of a portrait? No, uh, because there is losses. Uh, some people say that it was an Italian artist. Some people say it was a Netherlandish artist. But certainly we do know that Netherlandish artists uh, were well known for painting landscapes in the background. Uh, and by this time, there were uh, many uh, Netherlandish uh, pictures who had come in. Hans Memling, for example, was very, very famous for having uh, a beautiful landscape background behind his uh, portraits. So we've seen with Ghirlandaio, um, we've seen with Ghirlandaio this interest in uh, realism, uh, very calm and solid figures, uh, and uh, some influence in uh, classical antiquity, uh, certainly in the architectural settings, and also uh, the Netherlandish detail uh, has, uh, is an influence on him.